Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who are joining us on our heritage.org website and those joining us as well today via C-SPAN. We would ask everyone here in the house to make sure your cell phones have been turned off as a beginning courtesy to our program. And we, of course, will post the program on our Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. Hosting our discussion today is Brett Schaefer, our J. Kingham Senior Research Fellow in International Regulatory Affairs, part of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. Mr. Schaefer an analyzes a range of foreign policy issues focusing primarily on the United Nations and affiliated funds and programs, and frequently speaks and publishes on issues related to the world body and its activities. In 2009, he edited the book, Conundrum, The Limits of the United Nations and the Search for Alternatives, which features several fellow experts examining array of international activities and responsibilities conducted by the UN. He is a frequent visitor to Sub-Saharan Africa as well and has written on extensively on eco economic development, peace and security issues in that region. He first joined us here at Heritage in 1995. From March 2003 to 2004, he worked at the Pentagon as an assistant for international cor criminal court policy before returning here to Heritage. Please join me in welcoming Brett Schaefer. Brett. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, as we noted on the flyer, in recent years there have been a number of various stories, reports, and other sources uh, revealing a troubling number of scandals, uh, mishaps, uh, uh, misappropriations by the United Nations and its affiliated organizations. And I'll go through a few of them just to give you a sense for what we've seen. Earlier this year, the Associated Press reported, on, reported that the United Nations Office of Internal Oversight Services failed to pursue cases of corruption over the last five years, including major cases inherited from the procurement task force that was disbanded in 2008. Over the past few years, Francis Gurry, the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, uh, has been accused of covertly authorizing the transfer of dual-use technology to Iran and North Korea and acting illegally in efforts to identify the author of anonymous letters accusing him of financial improprieties and sexual harassment. Gurry was recently elected, uh, re-elected to uh, be Director General of WIPO. In late 2013, the UN Dispute Tribunal ruled that two whistleblowers who were, were retaliated against for exposing evidence, uh, exposing evidence tampering by a top UN official charged with investigating corruption were themselves retaliated against and uh, uh, by that top official who was their superior. Uh, the former spokesperson for the UN mission in, Darf in Darfur recently revealed in an interview to Foreign Policy magazine that the UN has routinely denied concealed or refused to report evidence that attacks on, of attacks on civilians in order to make the situation in Darfur appear more uh, uh, to, uh, to appear better or more stable than it actually is. Now all of this has happened while UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has made it repeatedly stated that his goal is to make the UN more transparent, more accountable, and more effective. Today we have three speakers two in person and one that unfortunately is going to have to uh, appear by Skype due to personal reasons. And each of them have come at the issue of transparency and accountability in the United Nations from a different perspective. First we have Edward Patrick Flaherty. He's an American lawyer and a senior partner in a Swiss law firm of Schwab, Flaherty and Associates in Geneva. He focuses on representing whistleblowers, staff members and third parties working for or injured by international organizations such as the UN, WIPO, the World Health Organization, and the International Labor Organization. James Wasserstrom is a U.S. diplomat who currently serves as an anti-corruption officer in the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Af Afghanistan. When it, while assigned to the U.N. peacekeeping operation in Kosovo, Wasserstrom blew the whistle on what he alleged was a conspiracy to pay $500 million in kickbacks to senior U.N. and Kosovo officials. He has experienced the U.N. process for dealing with whistleblower retaliation firsthand and can offer insights into its strengths, peculiarities, and how it compares to U.S. Uh, similar procedures. And finally, uh, Robert Appleton was an attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice before being asked to serve as Deputy Chief Legal Counsel for the Independent Inquiry Committee investigation into the U.N. oil for food scandal. His distinguished service in that role led to his being named the Chairman of the U.N. Procurement Task Force, 
which was responsible for investigating fraud and corruption in the UN Secretariat and in UN peacekeeping operations. Until earlier this, earlier this year, Bob was Director of Investigations and sen Senior Legal Counsel for the Global Fund. He recently joined Day Pitney LLP as a partner. Uh, and due to unexpected events, as I mentioned earlier, he'll be appearing by Skype. Following presentation, we'll have time for a few questions and answers from the audience. And before we get, begin, I also want to note that we invited the UN to pr uh, provide a panelist for this event. Uh, unfortunately, they were not able to provide one. So without any further ado, Ed, would you lead us off here? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Brett. I just want to thank you and, and the Heritage Foundation for inviting me today. Uh, I followed Brett's uh, work from afar for a long time, as with uh, James and Bob, and I feel a bit like the, uh, the piker here, given the distinguished backgrounds of, of the two other panelists. I'm just a uh, toiling lawyer trying to help some people in the field. But uh, unlike uh, Jim and, and Bob, I've also never worked for the UN. I did try to get a job when I first moved to Geneva 20 years ago, and, and uh, after I had a lunch with the ILO legal advisor, he told me, uh, that if I was 10 years younger, he might have hired me. Of course, I was only 35 at the time, but that was a bit of the problem, I think. Uh, the International Labor Office is not supposed to uh, discriminate on the basis of age, but what they often say is that a lot of their, their um, standards don't apply to them or to the, any of the other international organizations, which is also part of the problem. But um, as Brett said, I've represented a number of staff members and staff associations uh, during the 20 years that I've been in Geneva, and I've brought a number of cases uh, both internally and also in U.S. courts and also to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, one of uh, several of my more notable cases was the case of uh, uh, Cynthia Berzak versus uh, Rude Lubbers and, and others. He, Rude Lubbers was the High Commissioner of Refugees uh, in Geneva who was accused of sexually assaulting Ms. Berzak. Um, the case was investigated by IO, uh, IOIS, uh, the UN Internal Investigation Office, uh, their report found uh, her reports credible, but uh, Kofi Annan then decided that it wasn't credible for some unknown reason and put the report in the uh, trash bucket and never sent it to, to Ms. Burzak and exonerated uh, Mr. Lubbers. Uh, she then came to me and, and uh, because we really had no uh, remedy in the internal system, nor could we, we really bring any case in Geneva. The, the assault happened in Geneva, by the way. Um, so. We then tried to bring a case in, in uh, U.S. Federal District Court. We did bring the case. It was dismissed uh, because of the immunity of the U.N. Uh, we went, then went to the Second Circuit and challenged the immunity uh, of the U.N. Under, uh, as un unconstitutional. Unfortunately, although we did get argument, we didn't get uh, very much consideration in, in the decision. But I still uh, personally believe that the, the, the immunity of international organizations in the U.N. is unconstitutional under U.S. law, and I think eventually uh, it will be uh, overturned, whether hopefully in my lifetime or in my client's lifetime, but that remains to be seen. Um, I'm also uh, working uh, on, on, well, uh, I, I'm preparing a, uh, an amicus brief for a case now pending uh, also in, in the Federal District Court in Manhattan, brought by a number of uh, Haitian uh, survivors and um, uh, victims of the cholera epidemic, which was allegedly introduced, the cholera was allegedly introduced into Haiti uh, several after the, the uh, earthquake by UN peacekeepers, which caused approximately 8,000 deaths and 750,000 illnesses or sickness. People were hospitalized and whatnot. Um, the UN has refused to uh, impanel a, uh, the dispute resolution. Uh, body which is set up in the, the, the General Convention on Privileges and Immunities, and so the Haitians have been left to uh, bring an action in U.S. District Court. So I'm, I'm uh, right now the case is at the District Court level. The, the U.N. has challenged the case on the basis of the immunity. They, they, I expect the case will be dismissed, uh, and then it will be appealed presumably to the Second Circuit, and uh, I will probably be writing an amicus for um, I, I, sev several years ago, I founded a, uh, an NGO called the Center for Accountability of International Organizations in Geneva. On behalf of that NGO, we'll be pr uh, presuming that the, uh, the case is dismissed, which based on the, the uh, jurisprudence of, the, of uh, U.S. law to this point, I think will probably happen. Um, Brett asked me just to open briefly about what some of the problems are. 
uh, for UN staff members, uh, whistleblowers, and whatnot. Uh, as a practitioner, the big problem is that you have a, a system uh, of immunity where the international organizations are not subject to local laws uh, at all. Whether you're sitting in New York, whether you're sitting in Geneva, Nairobi, anywhere, um, doesn't matter. You're, you're, you're subject only to the UN internal uh, rules and regulations. And that ob obviously creates a problem, particularly if you have criminal activity, because the UN doesn't have any criminal code. Um, so if, as in the case of Lubbers, if uh, a staff member or the High Commissioner of Refugees commits an alleged criminal act, uh, the only re recourse of, of the victim is either internally or to try to go to the local courts, but then uh, because of the immunity, uh, it has to be lifted by, in this case, it would have been by the Secretary General. Um, but that, that very rarely happens. So what you have is you have a, a case of, um, with the internal system, this internal justice system set up in, in all these international organizations, the, um, the defendant is also the judge in a sense. They run it, they fund it, they create the rules. So it's not a very fair system as, as uh, many have said that there's absolutely no equality of arms whatsoever uh, in this system. And so you have perverse outcomes. Uh, you, uh, uh, what's happened recently in, in many of my cases, I, I mostly litigate before the, the UN Appeals Tribunal, which deals with most of the UN organizations, the U UN proper, and then the International Labor Office Administrative Tribunal, which is also based in Geneva. And there are about 40 different international organizations, intergovernmental organizations that subscribe to the, the jurisdiction of the ILO. And often you bring a case on behalf of a whistleblower or a uh, a dis, uh, disgruntled staff member, injured staff member, injured third party, and they, uh, you win on the merits, whether it's an employment case or whether it's a, an injury case, but uh, you then get piddling damages, and that's, you have no other recourse. That's the problem. Now, what I've tried to do uh, more recently is, is uh, challenge the UN's immunity uh, before the European Court of Human Rights, and actually there, there seems to be a more room for potential success there than I've had in the U.S. courts because in a, uh, a more recent case, um, the, the, uh, the European court uh, found that a, uh, uh, an employee of the uh, Kuwaiti embassy in Paris who had been fired, um, who then tried to sue in the, in the local labor courts in, in Paris um, and had his claim denied because of the sovereign immunity of, of Kuwait, uh, the European Court found that he could, in fact, bring his claim, that it was because he was not uh, performing any sovereign functions that they couldn't deny him his civil rights to bring his employment claim. Now, in the United States, in the U.S. courts, the U.S. Uh, courts have, have viewed employment matters as part of, you know, uh, protected by the sovereign immunity. So I think there is some room, uh, some potential uh, to use that case by analogy for staff members who, who work for international organizations, at least within the jurisdiction of the European Court, uh, which covers I don't know, some 37 to 38 European countries, including Russia and Ukraine, um, that, that they in fact may apply that, and we might be able to get around the immunity in, um, in those, those courts. But what the, the problem is you have there's no one guarding, guarding the guardians, the, the proverbial problem of, of who is going to be in charge, who's providing the oversight. In theory, it's the diplomats, it's the member states that are supposed to be providing the oversight and, and, and uh, accountability for the organizations. But diplomats make terrible overseers. Um, in Geneva particularly, uh, in many international organizations, uh, the children, spouses, relatives of, of ambassadors uh, have been hired. Uh, for as interns or staff members or consultants by these international organizations. And in fact, many ambassadors, after they finish their term, then go to work for these international organizations. This also, this creates obviously a clear conflict of interest. No one wants to upset the apple cart. They, you know, they foresee, well, when, when I'm done with my, my ambassadorial career, I can just go work for the UN somewhere. So I don't want to change, change anything that, that uh, might make me the, the skunk at the garden party. Um, this also happens, I, I, f I also find quite a revolving door between um, State Department, foreign ministry officials who again are there to be the overseers of the organizations but ultimately end up working for the organization. So there's, there really is 
there is no effective oversight, and the internal legal systems, and, and this is what Jim will, can speak to in much greater detail about his own experience, uh, just provide no real justice because it's, it's, a, it, it's a system that's set up by the defendant, it's controlled by the defendant, run by the defendant. So I, I find that very, very difficult. Uh, occasionally you do, you do get a, um, uh, a win for a client, but for the most part, uh, statistically, uh, just for example, the ILO Administrative Tribunal uh, staff members win less than 30 percent of the time. So it's, a, it's not a very effective system. There's no effective uh, system of discovery. As a, as a lawyer, you want to have, you know, I mean, you're, you're dealing in administrative law. Many things are done on, the, on paper. And to prove your case, you, you want to see the documents, you want to see communications. To get those documents is, is virtually impossible. It's worse than pulling teeth. And whenever I ask for, I mean, in, in every judgment I ever get, uh, particularly from the ILOAT, they always admonish me for my fishing expeditions because I'm asking for documents that are pertinent, but they still continue to, to claim that, well, you know, if you don't have the documents, you, don't, you haven't proven your case, so that's the end of it. Um, just very quickly, what can be done? Um, I think the immunity is, in my view, is, is, is the major problem. Um, there are times, certainly when the UN and other inter intergovernmental organizations should have the immunity. If they're in Congo in a war zone, there's no doubt about it. But in terms of claims that arise in New York or Geneva or Vienna, there's no need for it. I mean, they're developed countries with, with functioning legal systems that, that more than adequately can address many of the claims that arise in these organizations, whether it's sexual assault, sexual harassment, termination, uh, things of that nature. Um, how that will happen, I mean, there's many different ways. I mean, the, 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 the problem is, is the, um, now that the, uh, the UN immunity arises out of the General Convention, which was promulgated in 1945 and was accepted uh, or um, uh, ratified, I should say, by the U.S. Senate in 1971, I think. So um, one way to, and, and it, it gives international, it gives the UN, I should say, absolute immunity. Uh, so, and that was an issue in, in, in the, the Lubbers case where we tried to attack the, the, the action saying, well, how can sexual assault be part of the mandate of the, of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees? And the judge uh, at this, in the Second Circuit very plaintively said, well, I agree with you, but look, look at this convention. It, it, it's absolute. There's nothing we can do. So there are several ways to address it. One is perhaps applying the, the tort and commercial exceptions of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, which applies only to sovereign countries right now, to the UN, where there, there are specific exceptions to sovereign immunity, country immunity, such if you're engaged in commercial activity, if you commit a tort, if it's something to do with real estate. Another one is, is to simply, at least in the US, we obviously can't do this uh, worldwide, but to make uh, the immunity of, of the UN and international, other international organizations an affirmative defense, where instead of being an absolute bar to any claim that uh, instead, if, 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 if the immunity is a, applicable and is appropriate, you can raise that as an affirmative defense and then the judge at that point should dismiss. But right now, you never get to discovery, you never get to the, to the, the heart of the matter in a case brought in, in the U.S. court and in many courts nationwide because the, the, you file the claim and the U.N. says, oh, we have absolute immunity judge, dismiss the case, and the judges do that because that's, that's what the jurisprudence says. Two other very quick uh, solutions I have. Um, one is to, is to promulgate a UN Fraud Claims Act similar to the Federal Fraud, Fraud Claims Act, which is the Federal Fraud Claims Act turns individual whistleblowers into private attorneys, attorneys general where they can bring uh, actions on behalf of uh, international, uh, on behalf of the federal government to, to uh, re recover uh, fraudulent obtained funds. I think there's, there's room for something like that in the UN. Another important thing would be a, a Freedom of Information Act for the UN. Right now, getting information out of the UN is, as I said, is just is worse than pulling teeth. And how do you enforce those? One way to do it is to, is to have a set up a special tribunal that, uh, assuming you keep the immunity in place, which if you can't get rid of the immunity, this is an alternative, and is to any award made by this tribunal pursuant to the federal, uh, to the, the UN Fraud Claims Act or UN Freedom of Information Act is to reduce any, any of those awards uh, from the, the amounts that have been uh, allocated by Congress to 
uh, to the UN, which I think uh, Brett recently wrote something saying it was you know, the, the direct assessments are four or five billion a year, and I think the actually the uh, all in it's it's something huge, so it's double that at least. So that's another aspect. So I, I I can go on. You know, you can ask a lawyer to tell war stories, and it's uh, um, it's hard to shut them up. But I I think that. Uh, I, that sort of gives the, a, a, a general overview of what the problem is. And for me, it really is the immunity. And, I, and in, today, in, in the 21st century, there's no reason for the UN to, in, in, and other international organizations to enjoy an absolute immunity that, that sort of harkens back to the day of you know, kings and queens. You know, no, no government today enjoys absolute immunity. The, 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 the prevailing theory uh, in, in international discourse is a restricted theory of immunity, except with the UN. So I think you have to, um, you have to address that at the root of it, and it's only then can you have um, effective oversight and accountability of these organizations. And as I said, the, you know, the diplomats haven't done it, and they will never be able to do it. And it's, it's up to people like Jim um, and, and Bob when he worked at OIOS. Um, to, you know, to try to bring these, these organizations to heal and to, to bring them into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's hard to follow such an erudite <laughs> and learned presentation by someone who doesn't have that kind of learning or erudition. Uh, but as, as you know, <clears throat> My name is Jim Wasserstrom. I uh, am a UN whistleblower in the flesh. Um, this had, this, what I'm about to talk about has absolutely nothing to do with my current position or the US government or, or the US government's position vis-a-vis -vis the UN. <clears throat> this is my personal experience and my personal tale. Uh, I worked for the UN for 28 years. And for the last six of those, I was uh, attached to the UN peacekeeping operation in Kosovo. And part of my responsibilities at the time was oversight of the public utilities. And in the course of my, my duties, I discovered that, uh, well, there's an allegation that my colleagues in the UN, as well as some of the senior ministers in the Kosovo government, uh, were up to no good, that they were in the process, uh, possibly, of uh, fixing a bid that might have generated uh, a $500, billion, $500 million um, kickback. <clears throat> so I just tried to confirm it, I couldn't, uh, but I turned it over to OIOS. <clears throat> Sorry, to my, to my, uh, to the Inspector General of the UN, uh, at the time, Ingrid Alenius. And she and I agreed that we would, we would, I would cooperate in a, in a, an undercover investigation, which we did for several months. In the meantime, my colleagues found out about my cooperation with OIOS, and they engaged in egregious retaliation. Uh, and they trumped up charges against me uh, since we were administering the province at the time. Um, I was, uh, they controlled the police and justice system. So they, and on a weekend when I was, after I'd been accused of all kinds of, uh, of wrongdoing, and I was defending myself in, 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 in higher circles of the, of the UN operation there, they uh, blocked me from leaving. They arrested me at the border, brought me back to my apartment in illegal search of my, of my apartment, uh, confiscated materials. And um, in the end, I was put under investigation for, uh, for a year. Uh, there were, in, in actual fact, five investigations that went on simultaneously. Uh, three, three against me criminally or administratively. One was uh, an investigation that I was working on with, the, with OIOS. And one was an investigation that I uh, asked for and was granted on retaliation because I viewed all of this as retaliation. So after a year, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. Uh, and the investigation that I had cooperated in, the report vanished. We don't know what happened to it. Never saw the outcome. And for me personally, the retaliation investigation, the, uh, the um, investigators at OIOS came back with the finding that there was absolutely no retaliation involved. Despite the fact, yes, I was arrested, and yes, there was, there, there was an, an illegal search and seizure, seizure and yes, uh, all the terrible things that I had, I had, uh, I had said happened, had in fact happened, uh, there was no retaliation. This was random acts by rogue actors. I found that, of course, further retaliation. So in 2008, 
my solo practitioner attorney, Mary Dorman from Manhattan, and I filed a claim in the UN Dispute Tribunal. Uh, I was one of the first uh, whistleblowers to, to, uh, to take the ethics office, which was responsible for protecting me, and which I felt had done a horrendous job in protecting me, uh, take, took them to the UN Dispute Tribunal. And after um, four years, and the, the, the UN ignoring six orders of the court to turn over documents, which goes to Ed's point uh, about the, the uh, lack of access to information in the UN system. So this was their own tribunal ordering the Secretary General to turn over documents on six occasions, and he didn't do so. Eventually, the judge turned the documents over to my attorney and me, and in my view, uh, those documents uh, supported my claim. So in 2012, uh, the, the dispute tribunal in New York ruled in my favor. Uh, that was a very important victory for me personally, and I think for other whistleblowers, because it was the first case uh, of a whistleblower actually winning in the UN dispute tribunal courtroom. Um, he, he, the judge in the case decided he would separate the liability judgment from the damages judgment. Uh, so in this case, he found egregious and appalling the behavior of the Secretary General and a variety of other actors. Uh, all of this is on a matter of public record now. And uh, he decided to, with, to, uh, to have a separate trial on damages at a, at a later date. But after several months, uh, the judge changed his mind and decided not to have a separate trial. He said he had sufficient evidence. And, in, uh, and we presented evidence of the, the damages I had suffered. And in 2013, he issued a judgment which gave me roughly 2% of my estimated losses. Uh, those losses, by the way, were, were, were calculated by professionals, not by me, and they were uncontested by the UN. Uh, so in, in, in the face of absolutely no uh, controverting evidence, nothing to contradict what we put forward, the judge decided that this was only 2% of what I had, I had estimated. He essentially knocked out um, anything that had to do with, with my losses in terms of, of, um, of finances and to award a small amount for what they call moral injury, which is sort of the catch-all phrase for mental distress and damage to professional reputation and defamation and so on. Um, let's, it's, it's well to recall that, that, in fact, during this period, the UN <coughs> was continuing uh, to, to um, defame me uh, they had violated their own rules and procedures on, uh, on not speaking publicly about ongoing investigations, but they, can, they did so. And uh, in the end, uh, I got this very, very small award. And the point in all of this to me, and I want to be very clear about that, uh, was never about uh, compensation. This was always about truth and justice. And I know that may sound cliche uh, or somehow corny, but it, that was what it really was for me. Uh, I was violated. I, my career was, was ir irreparably damaged. My name was, was blasted out in dozens of countries as a corrupt UN official caught while attempting to flee uh, for, for a couple of years, and uh, the UN supported that uh, quietly or, or maybe not so quietly. And, and to, to have that very small award was a terrible message to send to other whistleblowers who might want to come forward. And that was really what it, turned, what, what it became for me, was how, why would anyone come forward to suffer what I had suffered uh, if, in the end, you don't, get, you, you don't get truth and you don't get justice? So we decided to, uh, to appeal this, this judgment and to ask for, for intervention uh, by, by um, the government, US government, to, to uh, put pressure on the UN. And earlier this year, in January, uh, with the support of Congress, uh, the 2014 Consolidated Appropriations Bill uh, was signed by the President. Uh, and in that, there is a section, 7048A1B, uh, that I do know, Ed, um, in which there is a, which refers specifically to transparency and accountability in UN agencies. And it requires that each and every UN agency adhere to whistleblower best practices. Now, there may be some debate as to what those are. I don't think there is any debate, really, but um, maybe one could argue it. Uh, but we very, we very specifically put in five provisions, uh, five very uh, pointed 
uh, enumerated best practices. And I'll refer to only a few here. Uh, please feel free to look it up uh, should you be that be interested. Uh, one is that, that uh, UN, the, the UN must have, uh, UN staff who are whistleblowers must have access to independent adjudication, external, uh, uh, some sort of uh, body that isn't controlled by the Secretary General. Secondly, that uh, whistleblowers should, should uh, victims, whistleblowers who are victims of proven retaliation uh, should have the consequences of that retaliation completely mitigated for direct or indirect or future consequences of their whistleblowing. In other words, we shouldn't suffer any consequences for, for, uh, for whistleblowing and have, then being victims of proven retaliation, either direct or indirect or those that may arise in the future. And the third, and I think this is very important, is that, that those who engage in retaliation should suffer some consequences. Because in, the, in my case, there were no consequences for anybody but me. Uh, all those who engaged in retaliation, who were named in all the various reports, went on to have great lives with no, no impact on them. So I was the only one who suffered any consequences. Um, so those are, those, are, those are three of the, of the areas that are highlighted uh, in this section of US law. Uh, my view on what, what's wrong uh, in the UN system, uh, having been one of them for 28 years, there, the, the accountability institutions of the UN, there are three of them essentially. There's the ethics office, which is the guardian of the faith when it comes to whistleblower protection. There's the Office of Internal Oversight Services, OIOS, to which Ed has referred. That's the Inspectorate General. And the third is the justice system. Each one of these uh, are, is broken in some way. Uh, for, the, for the ethics office, if we just look at the evidence, at the numbers, uh, and I get these from, from uh, the Government Accountability Project, uh, which, is, uh, which is representing me in terms of advocacy here in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, and we have the president of the, of the GAP here in the audience today, B. There, there have been, since the establishment of the Ethics Office in 2006, uh, as I, until at least 2013, uh, there have been more than 300 whistleblowers, or those who, who have inquired about whistleblowing, have come forward to the Ethics Office. Of those, the Ethics Office reviewed 99, and they found retaliation in only two cases. Two. Mine is not one of those two. Uh, they turned down my case of retaliation. But that's a, an astonishing low percentage, 0.5% or 2%, depending on what your denominator, denominator is, but it's a very, very low percentage. This is just a shame, profoundly. Second in, in o, is OIOS. Uh, there has been there is a, a there are cases of uh, that Ed has referred to that Brett has referred to uh, that that indicate witness tampering, evidence tampering, a lack of commitment to uh, to getting getting their job done, uh, free of political interference because clearly there there is political interference. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of what we discovered in terms of the evidence in my case uh, that that they used to say that there was no retaliation, but when we looked at it, it was absolutely clear that they chose to set aside evidence they had in their possession to find that there was no retaliation. And I don't know the explanation for that. Uh, third is the justice system. Um, as, as Ed has mentioned, they are, they, they are not independent. Uh, we would like them to be, uh, and there, have been, there are some very, very courageous uh, judges on, on both the dispute tribunal and the, admin, and the appeals tribunal. And, uh, but they, uh, they, have, they have complained about uh, tampering with the statute, their organic statute, the uh, statute which defines their, the, the, their domain, uh, as well as uh, the, the limits to how their case law can be applied to expanding the statute for whistleblower protection. So that, has, that is, is harmful to whistleblower protection. In my own case, uh, we will be hearing, have our, our, our appeal heard in, uh, in Vienna at the UN Appeals, UN Appeals Tribunal on Thursday. Uh, I will be going. 
and Ed has provided me with much discouragement this morning, uh, as have many others, but, uh, but I am not discouraged, uh, again, because I am here for the pursuit of, I, I feel I've got the truth out. I think people now understand what really happened, that I wasn't a corrupt UN official who, uh, who was fleeing uh, my, my alleged wrongdoing, but in fact, I was blowing the whistle on wrongdoing of my senior colleagues and of Kosovo officials. And the final judgment uh, in my case, I, we have been told, will be rendered in an oral pronouncement eight days later on the 27th of June. So at long last, uh, seven, more than seven years after all this happened, uh, I may be at the end of this long and winding and very tortured road, uh, which I don't believe will be the end, uh, because uh, I think with the new U.S. law uh, in place now, uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, requires each and every U.N. agency to adhere to whistleblower best practices or face an automatic withholding of 15 percent uh, of their U.S. contribution, and that is a substantial amount of money in most cases, uh, the U.N. is, is under pressure to, to change its ways. And uh, as far as, as Ed's point about immunity, I would add to that, uh, and I know this because I was once one of them, the culture of impunity. Uh, so it's both immunity and impunity. It's a nice ring to it, but it, it actually is the case uh, that the people at the top don't feel any real uh, commitment to cleaning up internal corruption, to protecting whistleblowers, uh, to reform, which we hear about over and over and over again uh, in the UN system. Uh, so uh, that, that is a, a grievous shortcoming. And one of my suggestions would be to have uh, some sort of external body that, uh, that is as independent as one can get uh, with funding and staffing which is independent of, uh, of UN mechanisms, but which has some sort of authority to make binding judgments on those in the Secretariat. Um, I don't know how that can be done, and I, I, I shrink from the task of trying to, to uh, take away immunity, it's, it's, and I admire those who are pursuing it, uh, because I think it is, it, it is definitely um, unwarranted uh, in, in many cases. But, but assuming that that remains in place, uh, these are, these, this is one idea, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, of the UN Ethics Office. I think with that track record of two out of more than 300 who've come forward, and the number keeps growing, but the number of those approved uh, as, uh, for, uh, as whistleblowers who've, who, have, who have proven their case of retaliation remains more or less the same. Um, uh, I think something must be done uh, with the ethics office, um, perhaps even getting rid of it. Uh, so with that, thanks, Brett, and thank you all for coming and inviting me today. And uh, Bob, we're ready for you whenever you're ready. Awesome. <clears throat> um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, we can, though maybe we can get the volume up a little bit higher. Okay. I was, I was having a little bit of trouble um, for the last, listening and hearing the last speaker, so I hope I won't cover too much of the same ground. But I guess first I'd like, uh, you know, Brett, thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. Obviously, it's critical issue, critical and critically important issues. Um, at a paramount, and it's um, a uh, testament that you're keeping these issues uh, at the forefront, and it uh, is so important. I think it, my initial remarks would be that I would echo the sentiments and completely agree with just about everything that the two previous sp speakers have um, uh, alluded to, and I think I'm going to go over some of the same areas um, that uh, were being raised, and hope I won't uh, be too repetitive, um, but I think it's worth emphasizing um, what, what it is that's deficient in, in these different pieces to the UN um, administration of justice puzzle. But again, to, just to uh, emphasize what Ed had said at the outset, I think one of the major problems here is, um, is the privileges and immunities that have been granted to the UN and the way those P&Is have been interpreted by the organization. And I agree that I think there's maybe a misinterpretation of the expansiveness and the reach uh, of uh, privileges and immunities, and it's causing 
<clears throat> wreaks uh, of havoc uh, that uh, ripple throughout the administration of justice um, in the UN. I, I would also offer that um, that hurts you know, the lack of uh, a, a true immunity um, function and um, framework hurts accountability. Uh, and what you're seeing is examples, especially of which you identified out at the outset, are a series of um, uh, instances which uh, demonstrate lacks of accountability, which quite frankly are um, you know, really something that is um, unacceptable. Uh, you know, when I came, first came into the UN, I first came in uh, with the oil food, food investigation with the Volcker panel, and I uh, was uh, tasked with my group leading the investigation of the um, Secretary General at the time and his son. And um, the Volcker Committee was an independent entity which was not bound by the rules and regulations of the UN and was able to do a little bit more of an independent investigation, I think, was uh, had an opportunity to be a little bit more um, accurate thorough and relevant. Um, but after that, when I became chairman of the task force, the procurement task force, it was an offshoot and it was within OIOF, excuse me, and we operated within the UN system, within the UN rules and under OIOS's um, rules. And the dynamic changed considerably. And what we saw develop um, was, uh, you know, if you didn't know any better, you thought the world was upside down because the investigator became um, the subject, and the subject uh, became the victim uh, in so many cases. In one case, uh, we proved um, very clearly that a uh, procurement official had steered over $100 million in contracts to a uh, telecommunications firm that hailed from the same country that he was from. Um, the case was pretty well done. The evidence was very solid. It was referred to the uh, national authorities in the Southern District in the U.S. who prosecuted the case uh, and who convicted the staff member um, uh, of fraud and um, uh, unlawful steering of contracts and illegal gratuities, and he got eight and a half years in jail for that. Now, as I think was pointed out earlier in the conversation, um, in order for a a criminal case to work in order for a criminal code to be applied to a UN staff member, the Secretary General has to waive the privileges and immunities of the organization. So if the, if the Secretary General does not choose to waive those P&Is, the person uh, can go completely scot-free of anything and everything he has, he has done um, uh, because there's no effective system to truly address the wrongdoing. Uh, so this is a major flaw, and it, this, this reverts back to the, uh, the immunity issue. Um, if you look at the successful uh, episodes of where there has been some accountability, it's mostly been by nation states um, in, in this context, and where the nation states pick up the uh, criminal cases on their own. So it's what happened to, and it's likely happened to all of our other cases, it didn't go the route of the national um, rep, national uh, body where they, a national authority was going to pursue them, uh, they went into the, it appears that they went into the black hole. There's cases that have not been followed up on. There's um, staff members that were identified as having misused, misappropriated funds, uh, embezzled funds uh, that have been not identified, uh, that have not been held accountable. Um, and so, the, you know, the big question is, well, why, why is that? Why could that ever happen in, you know, the, the world's arguably most advanced international organization? Well, I think you need to look at perhaps some other things here that have not been identified that, to round out the, the, the nature and scope and the dynamic, which is um, the UN, uh, you would think, does not, would want a strong oversight presence, it does not. Uh, why does it not? Does it not? Well, cases of misconduct, uh, cases of misappropriation, cases of malfeasance, cases of, of loss of taxpayer funds uh, are perceived in the UN as, as very bad press, very unwelcome news, and also uh, types of messaging that can jeopardize the very existence of the organization. Um, 
view of uh, many in the organization is that the UN, which it is dependent on donor uh, contributions, uh, is going to run into problems if donors see large headlines of corruption uh, and loss of funds, and then there will be a cessation of uh, donations to the organization, thereby um, ending the organization. So what you really have is a very strong um, self-preservation ideal that permeates the, the organization. And I'm not saying everyone, but I'm saying you know, certainly those in positions of power who uh, are responsible for um, their administration, for the many um, UN employees who uh, are making a career out of the UN. Um, you know, and they, those who hope, uh, just have, have to hope and pray, they put their head down that they never become a subject of a, of a case which is um, wrongly uh, or even rightly pursued um, because it could not end up, may not end up in their interest uh, with this kind of a dynamic and a framework. But with this kind of a, of a system and with this kind of a, a reality, um, the, it does not promote sound and effective um, administration of justice. And I think what was pointed out earlier was uh, the, the example of um, diplomats. You know, who is the, who's the real overseer here? Well, it's true. The real overseer are the member states and the diplomats. And what is that? Um, what well, would submit, as was, I think said earlier, is that it's, it presents a significant and con profound conflict of interest to have those who stand in um, uh, interested um, positions reviewing and overseeing and judging oversight and this function uh, from where they sit. I think what you need is a truly professional independent body uh, that is truly professional and not beholden to the administration, not beholden to the organization, that can um, review and identify uh, those actions and cases um, that have taken place and where there's challenges and claims that there's been errors and um, misconduct and also a lack of uh, justice. I mean, if you read the last case that came out of the um, UMDT tribunal about, I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, Brett, in your opening remarks, the case was actually about two um, investigators within OIOS who had been retaliated against for doing their job by uh, a senior member of that office. And to date, there has been no accountability and there's been no repercussion to that senior um, officer, despite the fact that the findings of the dispute tribunal judge were extremely strong, extremely clear, and uh, hardly profoundly challenged. Yet you have um, two whistleblowers who have been victimized, have suffered severe consequences to their career, and you have the... Um, perpetrator who is unaffected. So, you know, the, bat, the role is um, completely reversed and that kind of a, that kind of result sends a very sour message to the rest of the organization and the rest of the um, folks, not only in the oversight body, but also throughout the administration and the organization of how can we count on um, you know, this organization and, the, and especially the oversight body to effectively um, meet out sound uh, and proper investigations, yet you have results that are um, uh, occurring like that where you have uh, no accountability and victimized, even being after being identified as victims, even being found to be victims, and even being found to have been wronged have uh, still been uh, given minimal uh, to no recourse, and there's been no accountability to the wrongdoer. So it just it screams that this kind of a situation needs a, a complete and utter overhaul from numerous respects, and certainly um, a finding that you know the immunities that have been that have been put forth by the organization don't reach to the level and as far as that they claim they do is a significant start, but there also needs to be a more structured reconstruction of the accountability and oversight um, mechanisms in the organization to make them truly fair, truly accountable, truly free of conflict, 
um, and truly um, a way in which um, good cases and base cases with uh, that are have, have bases in fact are be able to brought to the system. And as I think the previous speaker was identifying, how the um, ethics office uh, has has not found um, any or any significant or very few significant retaliation cases. Retaliation is one of the hardest things to prove. I mean, uh, uh, and it is clear in many national contexts that retaliation can be proved by circumstantial evidence and can be, can be derived through inferences of existing facts. And I think um, without uh, an acknowledgement of, of that, as many national authorities have, you're never going to have an effective um, ethics office to bring retaliation claims until they can re re not realize, recognize that these cases are difficult to prove and they have to know what to look for in the certain indices that are commonly present um, in, in such cases. Because without uh, a strong whistleblower program where confidence can be built upon it, this sort of circumstance will not change, and there will be little to no incentive in the future for people to report wrongdoing and misconduct in the organization, uh, and especially when they don't see uh, a level of accountability, when cases are not um, uh, handled to fruition and to conclusion, when there aren't uh, final dispositions that are fair and just. Um, when there isn't a proper voice and a mechanism and a, and a, and a surety that complainants will not be harmed, and uh, when you know there's a mistake made that there can be uh, it can be corrected, whether it be in the judicial forum or uh, during the admit investigative process. And there's so many different as ways and aspects uh, in which these cases can be derailed through uh, errors, even innocent errors, not just intentional malfeasance uh, where these cases can go off the tracks and there have the profound circumstances is you have real lives and you have real careers that become ruined as a result of it. Thank you, Bob. Um, before we go to Q&A, I wonder if you could just briefly describe um, some of these successes of the uh, procurement task force, what made it different than the OIOS, and where those cases are right now. Um, you want me to answer that? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the, the task force in, nine, in 2006 took over more than 300 cases from the OIOS Investigations Division, which involved uh, procurement fraud, uh, financial malfeasance, financial fraud, and also it took over cases of eight senior staff members who would be accused of, of um, misconduct. Uh, in three years, as you can imagine, there was no way we could complete the uh, entire inventory of the, of the cases. Um, we completed uh, approximately, uh, I don't have my numbers in front of me, but about 200, a uh, little over 200 cases, uh, and we found um, more than 26 um, significant fraud and corruption schemes, some of which we concluded, some of which we hadn't that needed to be followed up. Um, and certainly some with uh, significant financial loss, others where there has been you know, pretty harsh mismanagement and um, misuse of UN funds and uh, misuse of UN positions. Uh, when we disbanded at the end of December of 2008, um, there's, uh, these cases for the most part went into a black hole. Cases we reported on, we heard nothing of, um, cases, many cases which we thought were sufficient to um, reach uh, at least uh, the administration of justice uh, were not taken there. Um, cases in which uh, there further clear further work um, needed to be done um, seemed not to have any further work. At least there wasn't any publicity or any kind of disclosure of any of significant further work to be done. And um, cases in which um, individuals and missions that identified, at least that had been found, alleged to have been found to have engaged in misconduct worthy of uh, cases in the administration of justice within the organization, not even outside it, 
um, were not taken up. Um, at least, it's certainly that's the the appearance that's being uh, provided, and nothing is uh, seems to have been done uh, for some time, which you know, dovetails into this you know this perception that um, there really isn't an incentive to to make these cases because when you make cases, um, you know you make you sometimes can make enemies, especially if um, officials are in senior positions, and there's a disincentive unless the investigator is truly protected to move forward on those cases. Uh, but anyway, long and short of it is um, there was a lot of work that seems to have uh, not been pursued and others that's been dropped, uh, cases that have been, have faltered and not um, made their way through the um, uh, justice um, uh, system. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few uh, questions and answers from the audience, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and lead off with one answer or one short question to both Ed and, and Jim over here. And that is, considering the outlined uh, uh, circumstances for the legislation that was just passed in January about the whistleblower standards uh, established by Congress, do you think that any UN organization currently meets those standards? No. <laughs> no? Absolutely. Absolutely not. No. And so you would be surprised if the administration could certify that a UN organization could meet those standards and that the money should be paid forward? Yeah. I don't think they should, but whether they will or not is a different question. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Sir, in the back, please. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't see someone with a microphone right now, but uh, just uh, state your question loudly and we'll have it answered here. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so the question is, how does the UN uh, judicial system arbitration process uh, base itself on common law, civil law, et cetera, and uh, what, to what extent the political uh, circumstances of an incident may come into play in the decisions that come out? So, um, Ed, you want to take that in first? Sure. Um, for the most part, my experience is that it's a mixture of the common law and civil code. Uh, and as to your second question, does that contribute to some of the problems? I think it does. I think uh, my experience is within the UN system, and, and, and Bob may weigh in on this too, is that it's um, much more based on documents. They do not uh, place great weight on witness testimonies, uh, cross-examination. 
it's pretty much as in the civil code where the document is, is superior. Um, and I think as to the, the, the last part, you know, is that a reason, um, you know, is there secrecy because there might be some underlying consideration? Probably, but that's, you're sort of describing the star chamber too. And you know, I thought we'd, we'd move beyond that. I, I think that, I mean, there are mechanisms that governments already de use to deal with sensitive issues. But, but today in the UN system or the IO system, I mean, you get, there's just no disclosure. I mean, and, and I think that's, you know, the this, this secrecy has to be dealt with other than just go away, um, in my view. Barbara, Jim? Jim? I would hate to see secrecy being used as an excuse Most of the whistleblowers I know have come forward, and I know now many of them, including the whistleblowers who, who, who came forward to the ethics office, whose cases were validated, and at least one of them uh, feels that uh, he's still being retaliated against. Um, and there's nothing dramatic, or mysterious, or secret, or no, no uh, quiet motive forces behind this that, that I'm aware of in almost any of the cases that have come that, 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 that of actual UN whistleblowers who's come forward. So I certainly wouldn't use that as an excuse for an action. Uh, Bob, do you have any comment about the, uh, the basis for the UN uh, judicial system? And in your experiences, did you uh, find that secrecy played into some of the judgments that came out or the yeah. failure to pursue them? Um, just quickly on the second part, absolutely. Um, but just answering the first part first, I think, well, there's two things. One, you have a, you have a, um, uh, a series of um, rules in the UN that are determined to base are uh, that are um, come from the, the charter of the or of the organization that form um, rules of conduct. They're called you know uh, uh, the, ver the various rules of conduct which are in, in the chapter one of the um, staff rules. So that's a basis for it can be a basis for a charge which comes really just out of the out of the charter. Uh, out of the seminal documents when the when the UN Charter was first promulgated back in the in the forties, you also have the second category, which is um, you know the national laws of the particular country that you're you're involved in, which some you know sometimes you you pay heed to as well. Um, you know if in fact you're in a certain country where you know for example um, you know bribery is accepted. Um, it's a good question because I think in those cases there really is sometimes a tension between uh, which um, you know which which law should be applied. Should it be the Western law that strictly prohibits paying bribes to secure contracts, or the local law which sees it as a custom and a duty um, and, and uh, a way of life to do so? So um, you know there, there is a real issue, uh, and the other issue that really dovetails into the secrecy piece is. What happens when you have a critical need in a certain area um, and your goods or services that have been procured have been procured corruptly, but it's critical you need to get that item, good um, medicine, food into that uh, peacekeeping mission or into that location. Um, otherwise, you know, people may uh, suffer and die. And so then which takes paramount importance there? You know, you're gonna you're gonna impose a um, uh, the system of law and accountability, uh, or are you going to um, uh, put a premium and a, and a uh, more importance on uh, the item or the good? And I can tell you, in the UN, a lot of times the importance of the item or good weighs out, and the issue that is uh, underlying it, you know, the bribery or the corruption, is buried. But, Thanks. but let, let, me, let me just mm -hmm. add to that. Uh, I think that those are exceptional cases and they should be examined one by one. And some of the underlying assumptions probably should be examined very carefully before, before making the leap of faith that this is the only way of getting those goods and services to the people in need. And that, that principle can very easily be abused. Ma'am? Uh, sure. Just to uh, repeat the question in case 
uh, the audience didn't hear it. She's asking is if, uh, if the new USL law enacted in January uh, is uh, addressing the issue of privileges and immunities under the UN uh, treaty. It doesn't specifically mention that issue. Uh, where that the issue of immunity dovetails with whistleblower best practice because it, there are five that are specifically mentioned. Uh, immunity is not among those five, but uh, in the, the, the larger work done on whistleblower best practice, there is a mention of immunity. And the, the um, withdrawal of immunity. And I think perhaps uh, one of our audience members can, can address that since a lot of the best work on whistleblower best practice has come from the Government Accountability Project. Um, Ed and, uh, and, and Bob, would you like to address how you would um, uh, go after this particular issue if you're trying to uh, uh, be more, uh, uh, to circumscribe the, the privileges and immunities in the UN to address this problem? I mean, one, one problem with, with uh, this law it, it, on a case-by-case -case basis comes the example that Brett gave in his opening about uh, WIPO. Um, WIPO derives most of its fund, funds from uh, patent application fees, m approximately 50% of which came, come from American uh, patent applicants. Uh, the U.S. government pays a very small amount of money to, to WIPO, um, so therefore, uh, and in my opinion, WIPO certainly does not comply with, with this law, um, but it's probably not going to make any difference because they don't get very much money from the U.S. and can, would be very happy, wouldn't care if the U.S. cut off uh, whatever contributions it's made, even though, in my view today, WIPO is one of the most corrupt organizations um, because of the lack of accountability. Um, so I think I, I applaud the work of, 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 of Jim and, and B at GAP because it's uh, certainly you have to do something like that, but I think it, it, it's, it's a start, but it doesn't, it, in a case like WIPO, it just doesn't address the problem. Bob, would you like to come in or are you fine? Oh. <clears throat> do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, ma'am. It'll be, it, it'll be done through the State Department. Yes, so I'm just saying, where does the ETP expect to be I think they've been, they're taking the effort very seriously. Uh, they have circulated a questionnaire uh, where they are gathering statistics on... Uh, on the, the law doesn't talk, is, is, is not focusing on policy, it's focusing on implementation of policy. Because the organization has policies, and some of them read very well but it's really how that policy has been implemented. So I think that, that they are taking it seriously and we'll see what they, what they come up with in the end. Uh, I think it'll be, it'll be submitted to Congress and it'll be up to Congress to, de to decide whether or not uh, there's these uh, the notifications, the documentation that's been collected and the facts presented are adequate. Uh, and I think that Government Accountability Project and other organizations will be watching this very closely. Okay, I'll conclude with a final question, um, and that is, do you get the sense that the United States is unique in its concern about these types of issues, or is the frustration with the treatment of whistleblowers within the UN system uh, more widespread than that? Well, one of the, one of the efforts that I'm trying to, uh, to undertake is to internationalize this movement for whistleblower protection uh, in the UN. And I am in touch with civil society organizations, governments, and uh, with media in a variety of other countries. Uh, I'm looking, working to work closely with major donors to the UN, and there's considerable interest. The fact that the US has taken this step has generated a lot of curiosity, uh, and other countries, particularly those which, which uh, have a strong rule of law uh, and strong belief in, in whistleblower protection are taking a look at taking action themselves, whether that means withholding or political pressure or in some, some other manifestation, I don't know. We're early days here, but there is interest in it uh, and media in other countries have, been, have picked this story up. They are quite actively pursuing it and that 
hopefully will generate a constituency that can put pressure on politicians in those countries to do the same thing as has happened here. I, I just, very quickly, I think the UN has to be treated, in, in, particularly in this type of question is, uh, as, as, you know, they exercise many of the, the I I indicators of being a sovereign state, although they're not a sovereign state, but uh, in fact they're almost like a supranational state in some instances because of the, of the immunity they enjoy. So, but they get a pass. For example, you know, Transparency International doesn't review the UN, and, and I'm not sure why. I think they should. Um, so I, I, I think we have to um, come back and, 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 and re-examine that as well to make sure that uh, if they are functioning as a quasi-state that they have the same uh, accountability and, and oversight. Um, whether that will happen or not, I'm not I, I hope, but whether, whether it will, I'm not sure. Bob, any final remarks? Uh, Bob, any final remarks? Oh, I'm sorry, kids. I'm in trouble <laughs> hearing it. No, I think um, you know, the, many, many of the important things have been said today, and I think the, a lot of the themes have been brought to the fore, and that um, you know, for an effective, it all, it all fits together for an effective administration of justice to have a viable whistleblower protection program, to have a viable um, uh, administration of justice, and to have a fair and equitable results and have investigations and cases treated um, properly, all of this is related and all of this needs to be addressed. Uh, and it's now, it's, you feel like there's an exasperation because these issues and these uh, episodes have been going on for some time. They come out in different fora, but, you know, this has been going on for uh, many years now. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of casualties and uh, really needs a vested interest and some real energy and enthusiasm to address it because um, those who have suffered, um, it would be really a, a travesty to have them just fall by the wayside and this, for this to continue. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming here today. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, good night, or goodbye, rather. Thanks, Brad.